Have you ever heard an extremely loud bang like that of an explosion and thought it was a bomb? Well, it's not in every case that a loud explosion is caused by a bomb, as it could simply be something called a sonic boom. This sonic boom happens when an aircraft flies faster than the speed of sound. This sound is really loud, and the vibration that accompanies it is strong enough to shatter glass windows. However, Lockheed Martin Skunk Work Division has created a solution to this in the form of the quiet supersonic aircraft, the X-59. How did they achieve this staggering feat? What is the difference between an earlier developed supersonic fighter and the X-59? Join us as we reveal the details of NASA's X-59 quiet supersonic jet that has shocked the world. Sonic booms are the very reason why there are no planes flying faster than the speed of sound for passengers right now, because it could be quite harmful. These problems were experienced with the Concorde, which stopped flying in 2003. Concorde had to slow down to regular speeds when it flew over land or near the coast. And rules still say that planes can go faster than the speed of sound over land to avoid bothering people with sonic booms. The Concorde was a fast aircraft that was developed by France and the United Kingdom. They started planning it in 1954, and both countries agreed to work on it in 1962. The supersonic aircraft cost about 70 million euros at the time, which is equal to about 1.39 billion today. However, it had a sonic boom with the pressure of about 2.2 pounds per square foot. And due to the loudness of sonic booms, many countries have banned supersonic flights over lander areas where people live. The FAA also restricts supersonic flights over land, except in specific military zones. However, NASA wants to change these rules by making the boom quieter, like a thump, so that new, quieter supersonic planes can be made and be used commercially. They're doing this with a program called Quest and a new plane called the X-59, which was introduced just recently. The X-59 is the newest in a line of test planes. The X-1 was the first one in 1947 to go faster than the speed of sound with a person inside while the X-15, which flew in 1967, still holds the record for the fastest flight by a person, reaching Mach 6.7. Now to the new supersonic aircraft. The X-50 mine was developed by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, with a 247.5 million contract from NASA. Now that it's finished being built, the X-59 will go through tests to make sure everything works together, including engine tests and driving tests. It's supposed to have its first flight later this year, before it tries its first quiet supersonic flight. What is the history behind the development of this aircraft? It all started in February 2016, when Lockheed Martin got a contract to design a plane, hoping it would be ready to fly by 2020. They were going to test a small model of the plane in a wind tunnel from February to April 2017 and plan to finish the first design review in two months' time from April. NASA asked for proposals in August 2017, and while three companies were interested, only Lockheed Martin ended up submitting a bid. NASA proceeded to give Lockheed Martin a 247.5 million contract to design, build, and deliver the low-boom X-plane by late 2021. In 2018, the U.S. Air Force told NASA they called the demonstrator the X-59 Quest ST. By October, NASA Langley finished three weeks of wind tunnel tests on a small model, testing how it behaved at different angles and speeds. They tested things like stability, control, and airflow using lasers building on what they already knew from past tests and computer simulations. Starting from November 5, 2018, NASA planned to do tests over two weeks to get feedback. They'd make up to eight loud sounds a day in different places, which 20 noise sensors and 400 residents would track. The residents would get $25 a week for helping. To make the loud sound, an f slash aa 18 Hornet plane would dive from 50,000 feet to briefly go faster than sound, creating different kinds of booms over Galveston, Texas, and the surrounding water. By then, Lockheed Martin had started making the first part of the plane in Palmdale, California. They started putting together the main parts of the plane by May 2019, and by June, they started to assemble it. They tested the external vision system on a King airplane at NASA Langley. Next, they planned to test how well the plane's inlets work in a wind tunnel at NASA Glenn Research Center using a smaller model of the plane. They had a big meeting to check the final design from September 9 to 13, 
before a report to NASA's Integrated Aviation Systems Program in November. After that, they would finish most of the drawings for building the plane. They aimed to finish putting together the wings in 2020, and by December that same year, they were halfway done building the plane with the first flight plan for 2022. After making sure it's safe to fly at the Armstrong Flight Research Center, NASA did a test to check the sound pattern of the shockwaves. They also plan to fly over U.S. cities to test how safe and quiet the X-59 is and see how people react. This information could help regulators decide if it's okay for supersonic planes to fly over land. Starting from 2023 to 2025, NASA planned to fly over communities to see how people felt about the noise. This would be used to make a new rule about sonic booms at a meeting in 2027, and a decision about supersonic travel over land could be made in 2028. NASA recently announced that they installed the General Electric F414 GE100 engine on the X-59 at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works in Palmdale, California. This engine is 13 feet long and can produce 22,000 pounds of thrust. As of December 2023 and early January 2024, the supersonic aircraft's first flight is planned for this year. Lockheed Martin shared a video of the X-59 rolling out of a hangar on August 4, 2023. Then on January 5, 2024, Lockheed Martin said they would reveal the X-59 within a week, which happened on January 12, 2024. NASA's X-59 went from just an idea to real life in a short time. Pam Melroy, NASA's deputy administrator, said it will change how we travel, making it faster and bringing people closer. Craig Nickel, a senior advisor at NASA, said it will be a lot quieter than Concorde or any other supersonic planes we have now. He explained that it's really long and thin, about 100 feet long, but with wings only 29 feet wide. The nose is a big part of its design, being about a third of the length. This sleek shape helps make the plane much quieter when it flies really fast. Despite the success of this supersonic aircraft, one question lingers. Why does a sonic boom happen? When a plane flies slower than the speed of sound, the sound waves it makes spread out in all directions. But when it goes faster than sound, the plane leaves its own sound behind. The sound waves squeeze together into one strong shock wave that starts at the front of the plane and ends at the back. When the strong shock wave reaches a person's ear, it makes a loud boom. This happens not just when the plane breaks the sound barrier, but as long as it's flying faster than sound. Anyone in a cone-shaped area under the plane can hear it. The X-59's design is meant to stop these shock waves from joining together. Instead, they spread out because of special shapes on the plane's surface. Also, the engine is on top of the plane instead of underneath, so the bottom stays smooth and doesn't send shock waves to the ground. Because of this, NASA thinks the X-59 will make only 75 decibels of noise when flying supersonic, while Concorde made 105 decibels. And Nickel explains that this means the X-59 might sound like far off thunder or someone closing a car door around the corner, which is more comfortable to the ears than the sound of an explosion. Some people might not even hear the boom, and if they do, it won't be very loud or startling because it will be spread out and not as loud as before. The plan for the research aircraft is for it to fly up 1.4 times the speed of sound, which would have produced a sonic boom in previous supersonic aircraft. Before that happens, the Quest team will do a bunch of test flights at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Then they'll move the plane to NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in California, where it will be based. The important part of the program will start later in 2024, with a series of test flights over six different neighborhoods across the U.S. These neighborhoods were picked because they have different kinds of weather and geography. Nichols said this will be an exciting part of the project because they'll involve the public and get them interested in science. The plan is similar to an experiment done by the Federal Aviation Administration in 1964. They flew supersonic fighter jets over Oklahoma City many times to see how people reacted to the loud booms, and just as you imagined, it didn't go well. Up to 20% of people were upset by the booms, and 4% even complained and asked for compensation for damage. Nickel explained that they don't want to make the same mistake, so they'll first test the X-59 in a restricted area to measure the booms. Only when they're sure it's safe will they fly over neighborhoods. 
and they'll still be careful to keep the booms at a low level. Then after flying the X-59 over the chosen neighborhoods, NASA will talk to the people living there to see how they feel about the noise. They want to make sure that a 75 decibel boom is okay with them, which is the goal of the whole project. The information collected like this will be shown to the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration and regulators from other countries. NASA thinks that if regulations change, new supersonic planes could fly on routes that aren't allowed now, like from New York to Los Angeles, and cut the flight time in half. However, it's quite unsure what these planes will look like or who will make them because the X-59 is just showing off new technology, not trying to be a real plane. Any future supersonic plane for passengers will probably look different, but some of the ideas from the X-59 might be useful. A few companies are already working on supersonic passenger planes and plan to fly them in less than 10 years, like Hermius, Boom, and Spike. But it's unlikely they'll use what NASA learns from the Quest program for their planes. Instead, it will probably help make the next generation of supersonic planes even better. Nickel thinks that these planes, which can fly anywhere, would make supersonic travel available to everyone, unlike Concorde, which was only for rich people. One of the major goals is to make fast travel like this something lots of people can use, and there's no reason why it can't happen. Let's discuss the differences between the Concorde and the X-59 design. Concorde is a unique aircraft with no tail, a narrow body allowing for four seats across, and room for 92 to 128 passengers. It has a curved, delta-shaped wing and a nose that can tilt down for better visibility when landing. It's powered by four Rolls-Royce slash Snecma turbojet engines with adjustable air intakes and extra power for takeoff and going faster than sound. Made of aluminum, it was the first passenger plane with analog fly-by-wire controls. It could fly really fast up to Mach 2.04 and stay at that speed for a long time at an altitude of 60,000 feet. Air France and British Airways were the only customers, each having seven planes for a total of 20 planes produced. Supersonic flights made travel much faster, but loud sonic booms limited Concorde to flying over the ocean for safety. Back in the days, Concorde's only rival was the Tupolev Tu-144, which carried passengers from November 1977 until a crash in May 1978. Another possible competitor, the Boeing 2707, was canceled in 1971 before any planes were made. On July 25, 2000, Air France Flight 4590 crashed soon after takeoff, killing all 109 people who were on board and four on the ground. This was the only deadly accident involving Concorde, and commercial flights stopped until November 2001. Concorde planes were retired in 2003, 27 years after they started flying passengers. Almost all of the 20 planes built are saved and shown in museums across Europe and North America. Not to the building process, its construction primarily utilized aluminum, incorporating a high temperature alloy akin to that used in aero engine pistons, ensuring lightweight yet robust structures. Its advanced features included a fully automated autopilot and auto throttle system, cutting edge electrically controlled analog fly-by-wire flight controls, and a sophisticated hydraulic system boasting triple redundancy for enhanced safety. Additionally, innovative technologies like the complex air data computer and sculpture milling techniques were employed to optimize performance, while the absence of an auxiliary power unit underscored its exclusive use at large airports equipped with ground air start carts. In December 1960, the Royal Aeronautical Society held a meeting called Supersonic Transport Implications, where people discussed different ideas about how to power a supersonic plane, like whether to put the engines in pods or bury them, and whether to use turbojet or ducted fan engines. Some thought it would be easier to manage the air around the engines if they were in pods, while others thought burying them could lead to more advanced designs. They also talked about the risks of having multiple engines share one intake, and how ducted fans could make less noise at airports, but might cause other problems. They believed they could make turbojet engines quiet enough for supersonic flight by using noise suppressors like those used on slower planes. The choice of engine configuration for Concorde was influenced by these discussions. Focusing on managing noise at airports, 
and how the engines would work together during extreme maneuvers. Testing and changes to the design and engine controls helped solve most issues, except for noise at airports and how the engines interacted at high speeds, which led to Concorde needing to be certified as a twin-engine plane above Mach 1.6. Rolls-Royce had a design idea called the RB.169 for Concorde when it was first being planned, but making a completely new engine for Concorde would have been too expensive. So they decided to use an engine that was already being used in another supersonic plane called the BACTSR2. This engine was called the Bessel Olympus MK320 turbojet, which was a modified version of an engine used in a slower plane called the Avro Vulcan Bomber. They were confident they could make the turbojet engine quieter, and a company called Senecma made big improvements in designing silencers. But by 1974, the silencers they were using didn't work well, although they still thought the planes that were already flying would meet the noise standards. They tried to make the engines quieter by using a version called the Olympus Mech Code 622, but it didn't happen the engines were placed behind the front edge of the wing, so there was a layer of air from the wing in front of the engine intake. Most of this air was redirected away, so it didn't affect how well the engine worked, except during certain maneuvers when it could cause problems. They figured out how to fix this issue by doing a lot of testing in wind tunnels and making changes to the front of the wings. Each engine on Concorde had its own air intake, and there was a plate between the engines to prevent one engine from affecting the other. Above a certain speed, around Mach 1.6, there was a risk of one engine's problem affecting the one next to it. They needed to fly long distances to be profitable, so they needed engines that were really efficient. They didn't use turbofan engines because they would create too much drag at high speeds. Instead, they used a type of engine called the Olympus turbojet, which they could improve to meet Concorde's needs. They only used the afterburners, or reheat, on takeoff and to go from just below the speed of sound to supersonic speeds between Mach 0.95 and 1.7. They turned off the afterburners for the rest of the flight. Because jet engines don't work well at low speeds, Concorde burned a lot of fuel just getting to the runway. They used a type of fuel called Jet A1. The design of Concorde's engine intakes was really important. They had to slow down the fast air coming in from the front of the plane to make it work well with the engines. They also had to make sure the air going into the engines was at the right pressure and temperature, and they had to deal with changes in air intake during different parts of the flight. If an engine failed during flight, it could cause serious problems, especially at supersonic speeds. But they found a way to handle this by changing how the air flowed into the engines. They also developed a way to control the intakes using a digital processor, which was a big deal at the time. Concorde's engines also caused heating issues because of the high speeds. The plane's structure and windows would get really hot during flight. They used special materials and designs to deal with this, and they also used the fuel on board to help cool down the cabin. During flight, Concorde's fuselage would expand because of the heat and speed, and the shape of the wings would change too. They designed the wings to be flexible enough to handle this, and they used a system to adjust the fuel distribution to help control the plane's balance. Despite being commercially operated for a long time, the Concorde had several issues. One of the reasons it was retired quite early, however, with the success of the X-59 and all thanks to technological advancements, aviation companies can now put resources together and develop a supersonic plane that is safe for the people on board and on the ground. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.